that a, a Amarillo that's dead or something? Yeah. Well, we had a bunch of Amarillo damage last year. I never. Are you guys, are they going to come up or after? Okay. Hello. Oh. Hi, everyone. Do we have everybody? Uh, hello. I'm Leslie Brothers, director of the Ulrich Museum of Art, and I'm so pleased to welcome you tonight along with our remote audience. It's a special treat to have in one place all three artists whose works are represented in the exhibition you see around you, Love in the Time of the Anthropocene. Tonight, the artists will talk about their own works, each other's works, and discuss the shared ideas and interests that underpin both their friendship and their artistic practices. I'll briefly introduce each of the artists and then hand the microphone to Ksenia Gerstein, our curator of modern and contemporary art, who curated this exhibition and will moderate tonight's conversation. Harry Evans. <laughs> K 
Perry Evans is a photographer whose career has spanned nearly 50 years. In that time, she's created images of Kansas, its prairies, and people, which form the single best known body of photographic work that represents our part of the country with insight, sensitivity, and beauty. Her works have been exhibited in numerous museum shows and could be found in the collections of the Art Institute of Chicago, MoMA, the Whitney Museum of American Art, and the Library of Congress, as well as, of course, the Ulrich Museum of Art, which proudly owns nine of Terry's prints, including one of our recent acquisitions on view in this exhibition. Philip Hying. Philip Hying is a photographer who grew up in Kansas City and now resides in Matfield Green. In between those two places, he lived and worked in New York and Paris, and his commercial and editorial photographs appeared in the International Herald Tribune, Condé Nast Publications, the New York Times Style Magazine, and the Wall Street Journal, among others. Philip returned to Kansas in 2008, creating new bodies of work and teaching photography at Johnson County Community College for nearly 10 years until 2019. The work in this exhibition represents the current phase of his life as he dedicates all his time to exploring and photographing the Flint Hills. Mary Kay. <laughs> Mary Kay creates paintings, drawings, and prints in her schoolhouse turned studio in Lindsburg, Kansas, where she and her husband, artist Frank Shaw, taught art at Bethany College for several decades. It's worth noting that the studio is surrounded by the most amazing garden from which Mary draws some of her inspiration. Her work has been shown widely in our region and was included in the 2014 traveling exhibition, State of the Art, created by the Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art. Her works can be found in the collections of Crystal Bridges, as well as the Spencer Museum of Art at the University of Kansas and the Art of Emprise collection. Before I turn the microphone over to Ksenia, I wanna thank Jana Irwin, our head of education, for all she does to develop the Ulrich's programs and make sure they run as smoothly as they do. Finally, I'd like to extend our deepest gratitude to the donors who supported our current exhibitions. Steve Overstreet, who donated in memory of James Sproul, Don and Ellie Skoken, Keith and Georgia Stevens, Dr. Guy and Carol Glidden, and Dr. Pat Purvis. Along with the ongoing support of the Salon Circle members and the funding we received from the city of Wichita, the contributions of our generous donors make the work we do at the Allrich possible. And now, without further ado, please enjoy tonight's program. You guys want to come up? No, I think. Thank you so much, Leslie, for the introduction. And hi, everyone. <laughs> um, we're going to get settled in here. And um, I did share the questions with Terry and Mary and Philip beforehand. So I know. Mary has some notes <laughs> um, so in case you're wondering why, but I'm sure then we're also going to go off the roadmap of what, of what I suggested we talk about. And most importantly, um, I'll try and open it up for Q&A sort of early because I really want to have, I want to make sure that everybody here has an opportunity to ask their own questions. Um, so, um, the first question I had for um, for the three artists 
was how did each of you come to be connected to the Kansas Prairie and how have your experiences with it shaped you? Good. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Super. Um, I probably do better if I read the uh, answers to the questions, so you'll have to excuse me as I do this. Um, I am connected to the prairie through default. Coming to Kansas because of a job opportunity, knowing very little about, about it as a place, let alone as one that still had small pieces of virgin prairie. And initially, in 1989, Terry took me to see the real prairie, revealing to me the minutiae and differences found by looking down into and through the plants and grasses. Over time, I have learnt to slow down my looking here and to quell my initial assumptions. Kansas was a large, largely empty place, so I have totally changed my view, thanks to Terry. <laughs> and then quickly, over time, the Land Institute in Salina has added to this appreciation. Through friendships and attending intense yearly programs of lectures at the, land, uh, the Lands Prairie Festival. This gave me access to thinking further about the endangerment of the prairie and our connections to place, and by extension, all native environments, and their essential role in the ecological survival of this world. So I think I was sort of stimulated, really, by the land in that sense. Um, all right, I can tell this is on. All right, um, so I came to know the prairie because um, I, uh, was asked to photographically record some uh, some work that some students at the Land Institute were doing on a nearby native prairie. Actually, that prairie, that prairie. It's it's in both of those pictures. That same one, uh, owned by Nick and Joyce Fint at uh, at the time. And uh, so as I was photographing the survey work they were doing, I started, really, I started really seeing what was there. Is this sort of, is this still okay, this mic? Oh, okay. So, um, so it was this huge revelation, and, and I knew I had to keep coming back. Can I just jump in for a second? Does anybody not know what the Land Institute is? Would it be helpful to anybody? Oh, no. I think for I think for most people, it's it's a place they know about. But Terry, maybe you would be a good person to give a gloss on what this kind of local oh. institution is. He is such, such a nice person. Thank you. <laughs> um, so the Land Institute was. Formed in um, Sam, you probably remember. 1976. Okay, 19, 1976, the Land Institute started, and their main work was started by Wes Jackson, and uh, he was trying to find uh, a natural system of agriculture based on polycultural perennial plants. And so, one of the first things that he did was in uh, 1978, start, he started to look at uh, native prairie and he laid down uh, meter square grids that were marked off with string and, and did plant counts to see how the prairie was existing in this complexity, if there were patterns of growth that could inform how an agriculture might look that was actually based on uh, on a, a pure ecosystem. So that's anyway. The, but the Land Institute has grown. They have a large staff and of scientists now. They have all kinds of uh, research going on, and have uh, finally, after 50 years, um, produced um, a grain that is now being commercially sold called Kernza. 
Um, but this, you know, this whole process, which they knew at the beginning, it, it's, it's taken 50 years to get it this far, and it's still going. But they have broad interests and uh, lectures and an annual prairie festival with many speakers. Okay. Thanks so much, Terry. Um, I first discovered the Flint Hills when I was about 10 years old because my brother uh, was a falconer. He is still a falconer. And so he brought me out here as a kind of hyperactive 10-year-old kid to flush rabbits for his red-tailed hawk to catch. And I, I, <clears throat> I just distinctly remember seeing this landscape, even though I had already spent quite a bit of time in Colorado in the mountains and crossing Kansas between Kansas City and Colorado with my family. We kind of lived between Colorado and Kansas City for a while. Uh, even though I'd seen that landscape, the Flint Hills at the age of 10 made a huge impression on me. And so I came out here, here and there a little bit, but later on I became a bicycle racer and I came out to train uh, and race uh, in, in the area. And that gave me a different kind of respect for it, for the scale and ferocity of it. Uh, and then later on when I became a photographer, of course, like all photographers, I came out here and very quickly discovered how hard it is to make a picture that is um, uh, not just a superficial echo of it, that is a picture that has some of the intensity of the place. So that became a big challenge. And then I became acquainted with uh, Terry and Mary through the Land Institute. Um, well, actually, I was acquainted with Terry beforehand through her work and I bumped into her a couple of times uh, at the Spencer Museum in Lawrence, but it was especially through our time at the Land In Institute that became pals, and now uh, the same situation with Mary, and uh, that's a very lucky circumstance. Later on, <clears throat> in the 80s, uh, I spent some time in France and came back and spent a, about a year in Kansas before moving back to Paris to stay, and during that year, uh, seeing the Flint Hills after having been in France already, it, then it really got a hold of me um, in a spiritual way, uh, in a, a kind of really deep physical way. And I think that has a lot to do with why I've chosen to live there and dedicate my life to it now. Thanks so much. And you guys have sort of started talking about my next question already. So the, the way this project came together okay. was that... Um, Leslie and I originally approached Terry and said, you know, we were interested in doing some kind of an exhibition project. And Terry said, you know, I have this brilliant idea. And she was the one who introduced us to Mary's work and Philip's work. And so um, I think for purposes of this project, kind of your friendship and relationships are inextricable from the way we ended up presenting the work in the space. And so, you know, if you could just talk a little bit more about that relationship and, you know, the Land Institute has come up. And so I'm curious sort of what it has been like. It sounds like you sort of you answered one of my questions, which is whether you're part of other communities, right, that care about these things. And I think you are. But so what has it been like to be artists who are embedded in these larger communities that care about the prairie and care about the environment more broadly? Do I want to go? Um, uh. <laughs> uh, yes, I do. Um, well, I mean, the, the sort of the sense of being part of community is, I think, sort of slightly complicated for me because I'm very introverted. So I think of myself and my communities as being um, a handful of people that I connect to. Um, and a lot of them are artists. And so when I'm with those artists, I think uh, the things that I really love to talk about as an artist are uh, how a painting works or how the work comes together, what the structures are, why, all the questions that maybe come out of, of building imagery. And, and then, of course, for people that are willing to dive deeply into that kind of conversation, usually the issues that come to the fore that are other than art are ones to do with politics and ones to do with environment. And then we sort of come back to those conversations. And I think it's very empowering to be part of a community that, I mean, I know there's an enormous community that doesn't, but there is a, this community that does care and love the environment and, and has deep passion for 
uh, the state of this world. Can you please put your microphone up by your mouth? Yes, sorry. <laughs> That's my... It's, yeah, I think oh, so. No, I mean, is that your squeaking? Okay. Uh, is that my squeaking? It is. Okay. <laughs> You're... Okay, never mind. Um, uh, the question is about being in larger community. Yeah. Um, well, I think in your case, my sense is that you're kind of a big driving force of that community. So maybe what, because I know you've curated, oh. uh, you've curated projects, you've brought artists together. So you work not only as an artist, but you kind of create this community of like-minded people around you. Oh, well, thanks, but that's, that's an exaggeration, you know. I mean, I, I'm I'm very much I'm very much an introvert too, and I. Um, but on the other hand, you know, what? But but I have a huge curiosity, and so I'm never shy about learning something and going to people who know what I want to know, and. Uh, and you know, you know, I think what's happening here is these questions are kind of um, weaving into each other. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, you know, so I've always, well, gosh, there's so much to say here. But, well, first, let me say what I started to say, which was that um, I've always been involved as an artist with uh, people in other disciplines, um, scientists, botanists, um, um, other kinds of artists, writers, um, people who are in different fields than I am. And, you know, I, I, have, I have close friends who are artists, but, you know, to, uh, to be connected with Philip and Mary in Kansas and with Larry Schwarm, who is also here tonight, has been a great uh, gift because... You know, we all have shared this love of Kansas and love of the prairie and the challenges of trying to make pictures about it. So, uh, so, so that has, it has been a great gift to be in, involved with these uh, particular uh, artists, photographers. Um, and I'll say more about Philip's work and Mary's work later. But I, I think, and, and then when I, I moved to Chicago, um, I don't know, 25 years ago or more, and so I have a, a different set of people there who are resources, but it's never quite the same as being with people who actually know the same land that I know. Go ahead. Um, so, we are kind of connected to outside communities that have names and organizations and even, for heaven's sake, a board of directors, which I find myself on the board of directors of Matfield Greenworks, and I see Cindy is a fellow board member, member that's here. Um, and these communities are important, and they, they do connect us, but the main community that I find myself interacting with is just the organic community of the prairie that includes a lot of people. Um, through networks of friendship and this shared affinity for this place that we have. I mean, I think ultimately that has brought everybody here tonight one way or the other. Um, and also, even though Terry, Mary, and I have been aware of each other's work, and I think even been, we were in the big botany show together at Spencer, isn't that correct? Um, <clears throat> pardon me. Um, so we've known that, yeah, we have shared interests, but seeing our work together in this kind of focused environment like this, it strikes me as like, no, wait a minute, we really do have uh, deep affinities uh, and conversations going on across our work that surprised even us, right, as we started looking at it. Um, so the word community is uh, very broad and inclusive uh, and organizes sometimes into groups with names and uh, organizations, uh, but I think it's very much a reflection of the place itself, the way it organizes through friendships and personal relationships and like, can I help you fix your tire kind of things. <laughs>
Is there something particular about being an artist in, I guess I'm like, I, I'm thinking about it, like, you know, I've cared about the environment for as long as I can remember. And, you know, like I sign petitions and I think of it as like, there's this world of activism and then there is like my art world, but they very rarely for me overlap. And I guess I'm wondering if there are like experiences you've had that where those things can overlap or where, um, yeah. So. I mean, I, I really do think that um, the, 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 the community that I'm connected to with artists are, are people who really are willing to talk deeply about making art. And I think those people that are willing to talk about in that depth with that kind of friction and com complication and imaginative energy are actually also very concerned about the environment. I don't think they really separate from each other. So I don't really know any artists that don't care about the environment. And maybe my, my realm of artists is very small, but I think the majority of people I know, and I, I, you know, I'm British, I come from, I lived 30 years in England, and, and the friends that I have in England who make art are all phenomenally connected to environmental movement. And I think, you know, having exhibitions like the exhibition that we were part of uh, at um, Big Botany up in the Spencer, um, I I've, I've was, you know, artists were revealed to me through that process of showing work who obviously were there because they had a, you know, a, a complete fascination with the botanical world. And, you know, you can't not be an activist if you've got any inkling of interest in, in the natural world. So I think the artists for me that, are, that I connect with are deeply connected, to the, you know, in many, many different ways. And you know, it goes across the world. There's a there's a connection between writers. You know, there are, there are all these extraordinary writers that I would say were my community. You know, people like Robert McFarlane, and um, I have to look at my list. <laughs> yeah, but you know, um, I, you know, endless people writing about the loss of place, the loss of connection, the way that we don't know how to see, we don't know how to. Um, bring love to a place, you know, we, we, we've lost deep connections to being as part of the natural world, we're inclined to step away, we think of it as this pretty thing we go to look at. And, you know, we, we disregard those that farm or live in really old ways that knew, you know, that where there's a confluence of a river coming up at a certain speed, coming down an inclination where there's grass lying in the water, it's called the lung. Or whatever that is, you know, the words held connection to the land, and because you had the word, you loved it. It's like it's all woven together. Sorry, that was a bit off course, but um, no, that, that was you know, that was think, beautiful. I just think that <laughs> artists. I don't think you can be an artist and not care about the environment. Who, who knows anybody that's an artist that doesn't? <laughs> <laughs> really? I don't. I no, I, I, I know lots. <laughs> no, I know. Well, you know, I think, I think there are so many issues right now. There's, uh, there's racism, you know, there's, uh, there are gender issues. And I know that all of those are connected. Yes, I know, I know. But not all artists are working like they're not all working specific, you know, some of them are working specifically with issues of violence in the cities or with specific issues of race. And yes, they are under, to me, the biggest umbrella is climate change. I know, I'm just saying, there, there are lots of artists working in lots of passionate ways um, for whom, the earth is not the primary driver or connector. And uh, just give me that. And, um, and I agree with you. And I, I mean, I agree with you about that it yeah. should be. Um, and, but in many ways, I also really respect, you know, there's, there's so many levels of problems and of ways to engage right now. So I really think, you know, I, I don't think it needs to be everybody's single focus. No, I don't think that, but I'm just saying that probably it's my single focus. 
Well, sure, it's so, mine. You know, I'm just fixated on my story because of that. You know, I'm probably a little bit more one of my well, I guess uh, what I wanted to say that I really appreciate you saying is this, this connect and this, this kinship with the earth that I think we feel, and many, many people I know do feel, writers and, and artists. Um, and uh, so anyway, I don't know why I felt the need to um, disagree with you. <laughs> well, well, one of the... One of, one of the buzzwords nowadays is intersectionality, and I think that kind of, you know, when I see that, I think of how everything kind of does fit under this major umbrella about the issues of our relationship to our environment, which includes all of our neighbors and yeah. all of their concerns, mm -hmm. human and non-human. Yes. Yeah, I, I think so, too. <laughs> okay. Now we're in court. That was great. I, I, I enjoyed. I enjoyed watching it. I feel like I need some popcorn. Um, <laughs> um, and I, I thought what you're saying, Mary, about words, and that has to do with a question I had. But about words, I think um, I was telling somebody today. There's a there's a street um, in Wichita called Corporate Hills Drive, and to me, it's just the most bizarre toponym anywhere ever. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because you like you name hills for, I guess, yeah, I'm used to like toponyms having, a, or at least pretending to have a meaningful connection to the land or like, you know, typically like what you do with a subdivision, right, is you destroy the whatever ecosystem was there before, but then you at least you named the, the subdivision after the ecosystem you had to destroy to build it. Um, well, <laughs> thousand oaks, right, and there's right. not one left. It's, it, it's, you know, it's absolutely everywhere. But like corporate hills, like who names a hill corporate hill? Anyway, so I, I think I think there's something about the power of language, and, and so I appreciate you saying that. Like I think working on this show has given me more language to think about the prairie or like the fact that it is apparently the most endangered of all ecosystems in the world in the sense that there is the least of it surviving relative to how much there used to be. I mean, the Amazon rainforest is being destroyed, right? But like such a gigantic swath of North America used to be covered by prairies and now there's the Flint Hills Preserve and that's like, that's the one little surviving bit. And so think like having that language to kind of understand this place better. And I think also having the eyes to see, like I'm a very recent transplant to, to this place. And I think working on this project has really accelerated for me, my ability to see it, like what you were saying is not an empty place, just, you know, like a gigantic yeah. lawn, which I'm not the first person to make that connection because prairie in French means lawn. So the French, when they came here, they're like, oh, look, a giant lawn. And, <laughs> and turns out there's more to it. <laughs> right. Um, but so to get back to the questions I share with you guys, so we, we speak, but speaking of the importance of words and language, we included in the show some of the quotes that came up when we were talking about sort of what the ideas were that connected us, that connected you. And so I think for the benefit of our audience, I was hoping you could say more about um, what have been some influences on you in your reading or in other things that you do that kind of again, brought you the, to these ideas that connect you, that connect your work? Um, well, I guess I could just run down a list of a few and then maybe talk about some specific ones, but um, I, pretty much everybody in Matt Field Green has read William Least Heat Moon's book, Prairie Earth. Uh, and it was funny, I actually came across that while I was living in Paris and I found it in the English language section of a French bookstore. I was like, well, well, Chase County, well, I've been there. I want to read this. And so I grabbed it. And I went to a not touristy little um, sort of family restaurant in a weird little kind of druggy district that had great food and it was inexpensive. And I'm sitting at a tiny table and I've got my book and I'm waiting for my food. These two fellows sit down next to me and start speaking kind of loud English. And they're talking away. And then all of a sudden they started talking about Cassidy. And I was like, what? <laughs> and it turned out they were Pizza Hut executives uh, that were in Paris to conquer Paris or whatever. But they, you know, they, they'd gone prairie chicken hunting out near Cassidy. 
uh, which is in Chase County, which the book is about. So that, you know, that really marked me. And even when, you know, whenever I would come back and visit from Paris, I'd grab my friend Doug, who's here in the front row, and we'd come down and spend some time visiting and photographing in the Flint Hills. So Prairie Earth was a pretty influential book. Um, another book, you know, uh, <clears throat> it's kind of hard to, in a brief statement, talk about the connection between philosophies and studies of consciousness and the prairie, but it's a connection that I've definitely made in my life. And uh, so Julian James's book, The Origin of Consciousness and the Breakdown of the Bicameral Mind, has been something that I've thought about a lot uh, over the years and definitely informs the way I work as a photographer and think of the arts and uh, relate to the prairie. <clears throat> um, anything written by Wendell Berry, Rachel Carson, Aldo Leopold, I think probably most of you know the canon of these, this, um, you know, group of, no, they're not really a group, but this uh, strain of literature <laughs> and authors. Um, the first book I read when I moved into my house in Matfield Green was Annie Dillard's Pilgrim at Tinker Creek. And that's had a big influence on my thinking in that I think the book is really about just holding still, not because you're tired. <laughs> uh, I have a hard time holding still, but holding still and being observant and letting the world around you inform you and holding your own energy, not holding still because you're tired or constrained, but because that's you're observing that energetic stillness that she describes in that book that brings so much information and the none of these pictures would be possible without that um stephen pinker's book the better angels of our nature is about the drastic reduction of human on human violence throughout human history um, and the arts has played a huge role in that i could talk at length about that book but i don't want to hog up all the time and you can just read the book the better angels of our nature by stephen pinker and then also I brought this tonight because I want to, there's a passage in here I want to apply to per, Terry's photography behind us. But uh, like I said, anything by Wendell Berry. And this book in here has an essay in it called um, Is Life a Miracle? And the essay was first given to me by my friend Doug in the front seat row here. And um, it's the piece of writing that's had more influence on how I perceive and interact with the world than anything else. Wendell Berry's essay, Is Life a Miracle? And life is a miracle, and um, we should approach it with <clears throat> the way you would any miracle, with the greatest gratitude and care. And uh, that's, that's been my grounding principle, even before I read it, but especially since I read it. Well, I'm actually going to read my bit here. So. Um, as a schoolgirl, part of our English literature syllabus required the reading of the romantic poets and Wordsworth's poetry in particular. And it was in part, and it was a part of a lengthy work, The Prelude, where I was, for the first time, deeply moved by poetry. This gave me a shot of camaraderie access to someone else's experience and sensations of ecstasy in the landscape, which I recognized and I felt very strongly about. So I think, um, you know, the, the, the experience of reading about a small boy in a boat traveling across one of the lakes in the Lake District and experiencing the turn of the earth, because as he looked at the mountains and the boat moved, the sky seemed to be moving around in a circular movement. I mean, you know, he says it way more poetically than that. But, <laughs> but I think um, it was a sort of an, a moment of epiphany when I realized that there was language to, to talk about the things I felt that I didn't know how to put into words. And then later on, I realized that there were other things or other languages into which I could put into into imagery what I felt about the ecstatic world or my connection to the natural world. Um, I do read fairly eclectically and I really, I mean, I think everyone's heard this quotation, but we read to know we're not alone, which the character of C.S. Lewis in William Nicholson's play Shadowlands says. 
And I think as I, I do read not to, to feel that I'm alone, and, um, and I think especially during this time of political division, the pandemic, and the sort of ecological abandonment, um, I think reading great thinkers and people who are willing to expand their ideas and to be vulnerable as they write about the complexities of what it is to be human in a world where we've been sort of taught to be, you know, number one chief and everybody else in the natural world is underneath us. You know, we've, we've had this Judeo-Christian sort of structure whereby we don't think of ourselves as part of the natural world, but kind of we've got very separated from it. And so in that same vein, at the moment, I'm drawn to certain books and authors ones that reveal possibilities and histories of caring about the deep and essential connection for humans to the natural world and who variously speak about the experiences of deep knowledge of place and all that inhabits a landscape. And importantly for me, have a recognition of the love, care, and sustenance that arrives as a consequence of that deep connection. And so the, the, I have a list, very quick list of people that I think I'm going back to at this very moment. And so Robert McFarlane's books, especially Landmarks, The Old Ways and Wild Places. Um, Roger Deacon's Waterlogged, Wildwood Journey Through Trees. Peregrine by J.A. Baker. Helen MacDonald's Vesper Flights and Ages for Hawk. Um, Nan Shepherd, the mountain where she writes about the Cairngorms in this most extraordinarily, um, she's so connected that she becomes the Cairngorms, and not in a sort of fanciful way, but in this deep rooted way, extraordinarily beautiful language. Um, you know, I'm sure everybody knows Michael Pollan's Botany of Desire. And then there's, a, there's a, a British author called Richard Maybe who wrote all sorts of things about early foraging. But he's written a piece called Home County, and he actually is writing about a county that, that, that I was born in in a place that's very close to where I was brought up. And he bought himself 16 acres, and he, t he talks with, he, he writes with a connectedness that is astounding and which I long for. Um, and then the last person whose book I really love is, is Being a Beast by uh, Charles Foster. I don't know if anyone's read that, but Ch Charles Foster decides that he and his, his fairly autistic, I think, son would, one of the examples is they would like to try and understand what it's like to be a badger. So, so they go to a friend's house or farm in Wales where the friend had lived, family had lived for 500 years. So already there is this incredible depth of connection to place. And then they burrow into the side of the hillside um, and they live as a badger, um, literally eating worms. Although, you know, their friend does occasionally bring them dinners. You know. <laughs> but we don't, we're not going to worry about that part. But, you know, they, they, they learn how to smell their way through the wood. They learn how to smell the different scents from different plants, the the when he has his children with him, they learn how to defecate in the, in the outside world. They, 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 no, they just, they become so part of the place. They, they understand what it's like to be in the burrow when it rains, when it's dry. Anyway, so that was very fascinating. Um, I think I'm gonna leave it at that. Um, so yeah, that's a wonderful book. And, uh, and, but it made me realize how much difference there is between me and the badger. And, <laughs> you know, I mean, to think that you could, that smell is yeah. your main um, sort of center of direction. Um, yeah, yeah, it really is. And, you know, I, I feel like we just are beginning to understand what it, what it would mean, how much we could learn from creatures that are not human, from all kinds of animals and birds and trees. And, you know, we're just beginning to get that. It's taken us way too long. But, you know, we're, and, and 
So that's one thing that I keep exploring in my reading now. Um, my favorite book of recent years is The Overstory um, by Richard Powers. And I love that book and uh, have actually gone through it more than once. Have any of you read that, The Overstory? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, so it's been very instructive to me, that book. Okay, so it's about trees and people who are in relationship with them. And it's a very, it's a sort of grand, large book um, with about nine characters that come up again and again, and each has a particular relationship to a tree. But, you know, that says so little about it because, um, I don't know, I don't think I have the words to explain it. That doesn't sound very interesting to me as I say it. But this book is um, uh, its so deep. You learn a lot about trees when you read it too, but, but you, you start thinking of trees as... Um, well, sorry to interrupt, maybe this would help. Don't you think that the book is kind of quilted together in a way like a forest itself? You oh, know, thank like, you. Right? Yes, uh -huh. but uh, you know, I see the kind of different stories in your photographs. I, I, I kind of wondered when you started doing this if maybe because the the way the structure of the book is written, it kind of hops from one vignette to the next, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And you're doing that in your photographs. Yeah, I don't know. Well, is there a relationship know. there? Well, you, you know that. Well, there probably the. Very likely is a relationship, but I didn't know it until you told me. So, I mean, I, I, hope, I hope that's true. Yeah. Uh, but, um, but I wanted to tell you then that he has just released a new book called um, uh, Bewilderment. It's about this first, the overstory is, I don't know, 800 pages or something. Bewilderment is a normal novel length, 300 pages approximately. It's very disturbing. And uh, so I don't know if I recommend it. I just finished it this last week. But it does say how we are and where we are. So, um, so we have to we have to look at where we are and we have to uh, find the beauty that's also there. And I think he, he does that in this new book. Anyway, he's... The overstory is very tough. You know, it's, it's disturbing, but I found it... I found it so marvelous, and the ending of it was so marvelous, I thought... Um, it didn't, you know, it didn't discourage me. Um, another person I like uh, who's, who's not writing about nature but whose work I love is uh, George Saunders, uh, Lincoln in the Bardo, and um, a more recent book, um, Swimming Across the Pond in the Rain. And this, have you read that, Georgia? Oh, okay, well, I think, I think you would like it. So, um, so, Swimming Across the Pond in the Rain is about, uh, so George Saunders teaches a class, a writing class, and in the class, he, it's for graduate students, I think he teaches at Syracuse, and he uses the example of seven Russian stories by noted classically known writers, Tolstoy, and um, now I can't remember the others. Um, Chekhov probably. What? Chekhov, probably. And Chekhov and five others. <laughs> and, uh, and, and then he sort of takes apart the stories and, and he discusses what makes them move forward and what you have to do. And he's also, he's just a wonderful writer. He's very funny and, um, and he's just profound. And the only frustrating thing is that uh, he, so he starts with the Russian story, and you just start to get into it, 
And then he stops and he says, all right, now we're going to talk about that page. And so you think, but I just wanted to read the story. Mm -hmm. So, but anyway, he, it gets better as you go along. But I learned so much from reading about writing. I learned so much about making pictures and about the whole uh, creative, uh, how creativity works. And for instance, he says, um, don't ever write a story if you already know how it turns out. People are going to feel really disappointed. <laughs> you know, they're going to know that from the outset. Well, I think it's the same about, uh, same about making these pictures. About, uh, if I already know what they're going to look like, what's the point? You know, there has to be some surprise involved. And I remember hearing a physicist say that in a talk I heard. You know, if I know what, I, what the outcome is of what I'm researching, then why do it? I do it to be surprised. And so I feel that way about, um, about my own work. But he makes a point of that in this book. Another writer that I really like, that I've been reading, I read a lot of fiction to inform my own work. And, uh, and a person I've been reading lately is uh, Louise Erdrich. Um, and the, the Watchman, the night, is it called The Watchman or The Night Watchman is a recent one um, that's just a wonderful book because everything she writes about also includes uh, lots of background and supportive um, information and stories about her own uh, native culture. And um, it's, it's just, they're beautiful books. Um, I think my new game plan is just to get artists to talk about the books they're reading. <laughs> that's, that's what the talks are going to be just you guys commenting on that. That was wonderful. Um, I'm mindful of the time, and I'm wondering if anybody in the audience has questions they want to share. I also w I was hoping to give each of the artists a chance to talk about a work that's not their own in the show, because I feel like that would be really fascinating to do. To do. Um, but... Um, so we'll do that, but please start thinking of your questions and please sort of be ready. We're going to have a mic floating around um, and we are going to get to that. But yeah, so the last prompt I gave everybody was just whether you could comment on a work that's not um, your own in the exhibition and talk about why it speaks to you or what connections you see between it and your work. Well, it, um, yeah, however, um, it's it was a very hard choice, you know. It's like I would really like to, to talk about Terry's and this. But I chose Philip's piece um, called A Brook Tributary to the South Fork of Cottonwood River on the Bell Ranch east of Cottonwood Falls. And it's this piece, I can, yeah. I can just show you where it is. It's this piece here. Um, I love this painting. I'm mean, painting, sorry. <laughs> I love this photograph. Uh, it's really moving to me. And I'm just going to read what I wrote. I cannot but help fall into this image, experiencing a series of physical and visual events that happen down, inside, and across the image by falling down into a tiny area of crystal clear water, a brook held by rocks, soil, moss, and collected natural detritus. I physically experience worlds of minutiae and enormity, all juxtaposed and layered upon each other. The hundreds of leaves that line the bottom of the brook and that are caught in the crevices of the limestone rock tell me of a presence of a variety of trees and shrubs whose larger forms I don't immediately see. But I'm looking deeper, very delicately, some are revealed in reflections of bare branches that are etched lightly across the image. The structures and veins of leaves mimic the structure of their parents' bare branches. Identification of many different types of trees are possible through the presence of these court leaves. Distinctive shapes of bur oak, elm, hackberry, and cottonwood 
so that the longer I stay with the image, the more the larger surroundings and the journey of this brook are brought into, my, into focus in my mind's eye. As I eventually travel to the far top corner of the image, I am released out through a tiny reflection of, of cloudy sky. The knowledge of the enormity of sky glimpsed here is momentarily released before I dive back into the contrasting intimacy of this tiny section of brook, a place obscure and easily passed by where I wish to remain because I know there is more to be seen, to be understood, and consequently to love in this encapsulating world of visual complexity held on the surface and beneath water, and now within my experience. <laughs> I mean, that's what happened. It's an incredibly moving piece because it has such slowness and it's a place you don't look at and it's a place that Philip knows deeply, clearly. And I think that's what I mean by the, you know, Robert McFarlane talked about in this book called Landmarks. He talks about our close identity with place and how we don't know how to do that. We don't know how to love the thing that isn't obviously, you know, the Grand Canyon that's enormous or something dramatic. This is a, there's a phenomenal drama and story and, and state of life and world and, and progression of event inside of a tiny place. It's beautiful. Well, can I just very briefly say, like, what I love about that description is it so perfectly applies to your own work, too. Wow. Like, the, the, the minutiae, the juxtaposition of the kind of the shapes that look like galaxies and shapes that exist on a really minute scale. I, I say, feel like the connection is just so clearly there. And she did it in painting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. that's like a couple of years. <laughs> okay. Um, well, uh, just I, I would like to talk about both Terry and Mary's work, but the rule is I've just got to talk about one. Um, but I will say quickly, I'm going to talk about one of Terry's pieces. Well, actually, all four of Terry's pieces, but I, I do want to say it's like, you know, you kind of did paint infinity there. Um, and it, it, it works for me, you know? I mean, really. I mean, we can, this could be a pat each other on the back club. Um, but I, I, you know, I think everybody in this room can look for themselves and see this is important work. It's not just us patting each other on the back. That's, that's an important painting. Uh, let me find this real quick here. Um, so I'm going to read... Um, a little bit from the essay I was talking about, um, Is Life a Miracle? And I think you'll immediately see how it applies to this, but uh, the difficulty of understanding the instantaneity of life is this. It is clear that we are alive only in the present, not in the past or in the future. The present we assume is this time, here we are in the present, in which we are alive, but how long a time is it? We immediately say, we immediately see that we must say, not very long. <clears throat> but exactly how long is it, the present? There is the difficulty, past and future never overlap, and they are, it seems, very close together. The time between them we conceive to be the present. The present seems to be the interval in which the future pours itself into the past. But how long is this interval? Does it have a measurable length? Does it in any verif verifiable way exist? The practical problem in short is that life is instantaneous, but we can deal with it only in terms of duration and only in our dealing, we are always by necessary necessity a little late. This is the dilemma and the tragedy of life in time. 
and our computers, no matter how capacious or fast, are there with us in this problem. But even supposing that an omniscient and extratemporal computer might be possible, I believe that its possibility is utterly ir irrelevant. What is relevant is that we humans are part of a life that is possible only because all living things have it somehow in common. And we do not, we probably cannot understand how it works. We are not superior to it. We cannot in any final sense own or control it. We cannot fully appreciate it. We cannot be grateful enough for it. It is ourselves, not our machines, who must recognize its beauty, its preciousness, and its mystery. If we don't, we won't take care of it. We will destroy it. And so Terry has taken us here and kind of expanded out the present. Uh, and even though these are photographs, suddenly we're confronted with a present in the present. And in that echoing, I think it really evokes that kind of life is a miracle, you know, the moment where we can deal with it and confront it and care for it and navigate is in this present that you quilted together with kind of a simple idea, but then you, this is putting a bunch of pictures together, but then you drew it and worked on it and pulled it out and gave us all these anchors to hold on to like the orange rectangle in the middle of this autumn field and they're full of things like that and so I find it not only beautiful to look at but profoundly moving and important because it really does evoke that you know temporality thank you um, and when I was First starting this series, I often would, when I would finish one, I would send it to Philip to, um, to because he always had some, um, he, he didn't always say, oh, that's great. He always, she got mad some, at me. <laughs> sometimes he would say, well, I think you should change this side over here. And I would think about that and I think, yeah, he's right. Or no, I like it the way it is. So, whatever. But, you know, we could, I could, I knew I could have a useful conversation with him about, um, what, what was on my mind and how the space was moving in, a, in the frame. Um, so I couldn't choose one. I had to talk about both. And um, since uh, Philip and I are in this conversation at the moment, I'll talk about Philip's work first. But again, I couldn't choose one. But what I'm choosing are um, the animals. Um, and also, I include in that the bird, the heron, the dead heron, and then so I include the, the two of the horse and the two of the goats and the snake. Are there, am I missing any of them? Yeah, and the spider, that's right. So he has a way of seeing animals and birds. He has some other pictures of birds. Oh, wait. Uh, those two, that at the end, that has birds. Well, there's an armadillo. There's an armadillo. And, there's, and then there's the dead armadillo. See yeah. how and many then, pictures then about... The, the dogs. Oh, yeah, the dogs. Um, so all these animals in his pictures, and yet none of them are cute. You know, <laughs> these are not the cute pictures that you see on Facebook. These are pictures that that recognize the, both the dignity and the wonder about each of these animals. You know, I'm particularly fond of the ones that are about the goat because, you know, how often do we really look at a goat and that goat has real presence and personality and um, exists in, there's a sense of relationship there uh, with Philip and, um, and then, and, and then the one, uh, the heron, uh, that had just died, um, he has, um, I don't know if any of you have heard the story that some friends of his called him and they had just seen this heron uh, get electrocuted and they told him, you know, they felt badly and they couldn't do anything to help it and would he come and photograph it. And so, so that heron has only been dead, you know, less than an hour. And the beauty of it and the grace of it, you know, he has this ability to show 
uh, this the grace of animals that one of the horse with its head and legs coming up are just you know that picture I think is extraordinary, um, and then Mary. So you know I uh, Mary and I have been friends a long time, and I was um, seeing this painting when it was starting, which was when. Oh, well, um, I just wanted to know when she started it. No, that's... Oh, I, um, well, I started it really a long time ago, like yeah. 20 years ago, but then I left it alone, and then I came back to it, and then I left it alone, and I came back to it. So it's many, 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 many years. And I think it's possible that I've seen it in each stage. Yeah, so... Um, so it's been extraordinary to watch this painting evolve. And then it got to this place where it was shown at the, um, I forgot the name of it, in, you know, at Crystal Bridges. And Sam and I made a trip there to see it. And, uh, and it, you know, it was so remarkable. Well, Mary went back into it and changed it completely for this show. And, if you're if you look quickly online before she uh, replaces the earlier version, you can see the other one, and then you can see how she's changed it. And to me, the way you've changed it is to um, add. I mean, you you've changed it in 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 very important painterly ways about how one moves through the painting and from one passage to another. But you've also added so much life to it. It's like the, the complexity and the depth of all life in the natural world has just increased exponentially. Exponentially, yeah. And um, so, you know, so I, I could just look at this painting forever um, with great pleasure. Uh, and she has inspired me because I think not, I wasn't consciously thinking about Mary's work either in these, but I also, but I was thinking about how making these pictures of mine were more, were closer to making a painting than anything I had done since I was an undergraduate painting student. Um, because it was possible to work all over the whole thing at one time. And I don't know if that's how you work, but do you work? Are you sort of bringing it up all at the same time? Um, yes, probably. I, I, um, I suppose, you know, those of us who are painters and makers, you know, you change one thing and then the whole thing says, well, huh, you know, you can't just change me and leave it alone. You've got to, every, every change you make in a work calls for changes across the surface in other places. And so, um, with time, and it's actually one of the things that I think is interesting for me. You know, I think you had a question about I, it wasn't really about our, pro, our process, but you know, what were the what were the things that informed um, where did we get our ideas from, basically? And I suppose what's interesting, I think, as a painter, I really don't find the ideas until actually when I've really reworked it about six or so, so times, you know, it's like the meaning comes through the moving of material. And so um, by being in the studio experimenting and moving things around, which to go back to your question, is about um, making a, a space or a, a movement and a gesture and realizing that everything else is connected to it. It's like pulling on a string, you know, and Everything's following along behind. And so I need always to go back in. But, but meaning comes only in the process of making. So I don't think, oh, I'm going to paint a complicated painting. It's, it's, yeah, it happens to right, like we were saying earlier. Um, but also, I, I sort of, it's sort of like cleaning house. You know, when you clean this one corner, then you can't just leave it, then you've got to, or you clean out the closet, and then, oh gosh, now I've got to. This is why my house isn't totally so, Yeah, <laughs> so it's never ending. That's right, but I forgot one thing I wanted to say about Philip's work too, and one of the things I really enjoy most about your work is uh, your sense of wonder uh, when you're out 
uh, looking around. You know, he constantly has this sense of wonder about um, this wonderment at what he's seen and finding. I love that. Uh, I encourage you all to have that sense of wonder. Um, Which, I, you know, I don't know how you can get through the day without it, really. Speaking of a sense of wonder, <laughs> I think people do, and they're going to ask questions. I didn't, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I want to. That's fine. I'm I wonder if each of you um, could comment on the mecha mechanism of, I, I think it's subconscious, not unconscious, but subconscious in, in your work. Um, it's only been sitting here. I think it's a little obvious in Mary's work and not necessarily uh, for photography, but you really turn your back against realism. And um, so I'm, I'm thinking as you create images, the unconscious is important and wonder what you think about that. So you're asking the role of the un subconscious in our in our process of making work or not? Uh, well, being subconscious, um, seldom aware of it, but every now and then it raises its head and it just bowls me over how powerful it is. And uh, I did a book project that took 15 years called Code, and it's kind of about the phenomenology of photography. And I, I can't go into the details about it. It gets too elaborate and we don't have time for it tonight. But there were a couple of coincidences that happened in, in the final version of that book that just revealed to me for 15 years I'd held, had, had this structure, elaborate structure, and these elaborate relationships just sitting around in there waiting to come out. And then all of a sudden it was there in front of my eyes and it was just like, whoa, wait, there, this works. <laughs> there really is a subconscious. Uh, and, um, you know, it was like a curtain had been lifted and I saw that like how much had been going on behind what I was aware of in my work. I mean, I, I think it's, it's a very powerful element and, and because it's subconscious, you know, it's, it's a revelation is really at the end of the painting. You know, you realize what you've been, what, what you've been searching for only through this making process. And so, um, the connect, I suppose the, I mean, it sounds rather grandiose, but I would, I would love to feel when I'm making the painting that I am connected to um, a what uh, the energy or the world of the ecstatic and what that means, and then our and then our our sense of of release into infinity and the kind of those worlds, how those worlds touch are touched in all of us by the unconscious. I mean, we, I'm not making myself very clear. Is that, does that make any sense to you, Patricia? <laughs> it's yes, hard, it's hard to polite. talk about the subconscious. It is, it? I mean, you know, it is, it, but I mean, I, yes, yes, it is, it is there. Um, uh, go on. Um. You know, I am such a straightforward person that I never know these things till much later. Even though, um, oh, I just can't talk about it. I mean, I, I just can't. I mean, I know some things, but I can't say them to all of you. So, yeah. In terms of the mechanism, one quote that came up in our conversations was, I think you, Philip, shared it from Elaine Scarry. Um, I think it was from Beauty and Being Just, but it, it struck with, it stuck with me, like of all the things we talked about, I think it stuck with me the most, actually. And she talks about putting, like knowing to put yourself in the way of beauty, that you don't like, you don't know what you're going to come up with, 
but you just sort of know to put yourself in the way of things that are then gonna come to you. And like having been to Mary's studio, like it's an astonishing place. It's a former schoolhouse gym that she's filled up with tubs and bins and all kind of assortments of natural materials. And so I feel like you live with them like day in and day out, right? Or Terry, who's been to the to Jackson Park. Is it Jackson Park? Is that right? Like 17 times, right? Or Philip, who will lay under a tree for hours just waiting for birds to show up. So I think maybe like unconsciously knowing, and I, I, f I find myself in my own life that like I will just like, I'm putting myself in the way of things and then suddenly they're revealed. But I think like making that commitment to just be there and trust that something will show up maybe has something to do with like subconsciously knowing where you need to be. I don't know if that's helpful at all, but that's something that I've thought about in connection to your guys' work. Yeah, I mean, I think the whole thing of, 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 of building an image where you're deeply attracted to material, you're deeply attracted to moving things around on the surface in a particular way and you have no idea why you're doing it and you don't really need to know. And one of the anxieties is, is that I think we have as artists is that we, think we, you know, we sometimes think, oh my God, you know, what am I doing this for? Like, what is this chaos? But out of it, out of this moving things around, which is that same thing, like lying under the tree or continuously visiting a place, being embedded inside of something reveals one's psyche, one's connection to place, one's love of light or material or beauty or whatever. It all comes together to say something that you don't even imagine you're trying to say. Did you have anything else? Mm. Uh, I also find that there are a couple of different kinds of subconscious. Um, there's the subconscious that uh, I became very aware of a few years ago. I just, a friend of mine talked me into practicing, you know, trying to learn to play guitar. And I would practice a lot and practice and practice. And I get to a certain point where I could do things that were pretty complex subconsciously, you know? I mean, when you're first learning it and like you're going like, how are you ever, how am I ever going to do a G chord? I mean, it's really hard. And then, you know, after a while, next thing you know, you're not only doing a G chord, but you're suspending it, you know, with a bend <laughs> and, and without thinking about it. Uh, and that happens very much, you know, as I was teaching photography, I used to talk to my students about the necessity of practicing every day. And you do get to where, well, for instance, these pictures right there, um, I wasn't even looking through the viewfinder when I shot them. Um, I just knew that was what, if I put my camera here, that's, this is what will be recorded on the sensor. So that was subconscious. But there's another kind of subconscious that I think is very different, probably a very different part of my brain or part of our brains. Uh, that holds structures, ideas, dream images, narratives, uh, impulses, you know, the whole Freudian kind of subconscious, um, which although Freud is disparaged a lot in a lot of circles, I, I think it's still extremely relevant. And there is that, that does come up. Um, you know, you guys don't realize it, but these pictures are jam-packed with naughty bits. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I think of the I think of the goat as almost indecent because she, I I see I like I see a, a reclining nude when yes. I see the goat and I was like she's she's like it's a sexy goat yeah but I'm sure there's more and I'd love to hear about more. <laughs> we have another yes. question. Uh, yeah, so I think you all kind of mentioned it that we can learn from nature, we can learn from the prairie, from the prairie, and I think that connects to the Land Institute and other conservation work that we learn from this ecosystem and and how it works. And so I was wondering if you could tell us about a time that you learned from the prairie and what it taught you. Okay. Um, so for me, the prairie is the organizing principle of of almost everything that I have uh, photographed or made uh, ever since I first discovered it in 1978 you know I couldn't tell who was speaking who was who was just speaking oh okay thank you I can look at look at you then um, but the prairie contains such a complexity, and if, if you're looking at a virgin prairie, an untouched prairie, the, um, 
the complexity of it is so deep and I can stand and look at, you know, look at the ground at my feet for an hour and still not even begin to see what's there. And when I first started photographing it, I thought if just I could understand the patterns of the prairie, I could understand the universe. And I still think that's probably true. Um, and I still have a long, long ways to go. But, but everything I've photographed since, I have wondered before I have known if it was something I could commit to, I have to, I have to know if it embodies the values that the prairie embodies. And I realized, I wrote this, made this note, um, that the prairie gave me values by which to measure everything else. And I thought, well, how, what does that mean? Um, I think it means that on an, in a native, in an untouched ecosystem, everything in it is being itself and, and is acting in relationship with everything else. It doesn't mean that some things don't dominate sometimes or some things uh, die or that, um, you know, one year I was photographing there at the Fent Prairie. Well, this was just a few years ago. And um, there, weren't, there weren't any blossoms on my favorite plant, which is uh, wild indigo. And it worried me a lot. And the next year, there were blossoms. So, you know, there, there, there is a mystery there and there is a sense of rightness or, um, or balance that, uh, that carries a kind of wisdom that, um, that I don't think we can fully understand, but that we can trust. I don't know if that makes any sense. I, even as I say it, I don't, I don't know how to say how much I respect and learn from looking at an untouched ecosystem. It is the most um, extraordinary uh, experience. And um, so now I don't, oh, you asked the question, what have we learned, right? Um, so, you know, it has given me a feeling of connection to all the rest of life, and that just vibrates through everything else. Well, I. <laughs> oh, I do. <laughs> Sorry about that. Talk about greedy. Um, well, actually, that really plays into what the prairie has given me, which is a kind of fury. I mean, I think the, the fact that there is like, I don't know what the percentage of prairie that's left in, in Kansas is, is like 1% or something terrifying, not that much even. Okay, so that's even worse. So um, I think the prairie has given me this kind of constant fury about the agriculture that surrounds, for example, where I live, which is all industrial agriculture, monoculture, inside of dead earth, you know, where everybody's, you know, oh God, it's being sprayed, you know, like three times a year, and pesticides and herbicides are sprayed all over it, and they all blow into my yard where I don't do any of that stuff. And, you know, so I'm, I'm pissed off because I know what it could be. Or the fact that, you know, down the road from us, there was, I think, maybe about four acres or five acres of uh, old untilled land. And then the owner died and they rented the land out. And, you know, and the farmer, of course, was terribly excited, plowed it up and had, you know, this enormous crop of, of corn, you know, of wheat, what, what we call corn in England. What do you call it? Wheat. You know, it's just like the thing looked like it was, you know, we're going to eat the world. It was so healthy. Well, yes, of course. It's a most extraordinary piece of soil. So I think that's what the prairie has given me. There's sort of a, an anger that I don't know where to put. Uh, I can relate to that, that anger. Um, 
I will say that I, in a key part point in my life, um, I saw the, a John Journal poem that um, has been really valuable to me, and it says, "Anger never does what you want it to do." <laughs> but I, I, I'm, I'm really angry about it. But I know, you know, I don't dismiss my anger, but I know that that's not going to be. It's not going to do what I want it to do, which is to fix everything, right? Um, there are a number of things that I've learned that uh, would, would could be kind of school, like names of plants and things like that, and, and you know, uh, like armadillos swim. I didn't know that. I know that now. <laughs> but it's kind of a great thing to know. But the most powerful thing really uh, has just been the last couple of years where I've been there and photographed right after a burn when everything is just down to the soil and a little chalk, you know, charred stubble. And then just now hiking through the grass that is, you know, in, in the good places, it's this high and it's so dense that you have to push your way through it and find a game trail to follow. Otherwise you aren't going to get through it. And that happens in a matter of what, seven months over five months. And it's nothing but sunlight and water. <laughs> And it just produces this mass of life. And soil. And soil well, is and it, not damaged by all it. kinds of things. Um, yeah, it's uh, the force of it and the energy of it and the miracle of it, frankly. Um, <clears throat> there's no substitute for it. And I, you, I, I could explain it to you and you can understand it and maybe even kind of appreciate it, but to see it and be living in it is another thing entirely and I highly recommend getting engaged with it and uh, it'll turn you into an activist. Yeah. I think Now, I think this is my cue to say thank you to you guys. Um, this was just extraordinary. It's so wonderful to have had the chance to, to have this conversation with you, to have all of you in this room. If people want to stick around and ask questions and come up and talk to us, you can. If people need to leave, also totally understandable. Um, but thank you guys again. This was amazing. Thank you. Thank you, thank you all.